<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm State Senator Michael Rodericks, the chair of the Senate Committee on Ethics, and with me uh, are my uh, colleagues on the committee. We have Senator Richard Ross. We have Minority Leader Bruce Tarr. We have Senator Will Brownsberger, the, sen the vice chair, Senator Cindy Friedman, Senator Cynthia Cream. Uh, we also have our team from Hogan Lovells, um, our lead investigators, independent investigators um, uh, on the investigation. Senate Order 2228 tasked the committee with reviewing the question of the conduct of Senator Stanley C. Rosenberg and whether he violated the rules of the Senate. The Senate has constitutional authority to discipline its members. That authority has been described as a power of protection and exists to protect the integrity of the Senate as an institution. Today, we filed our report concerning the conduct of Senator Stanley C. Rosenberg. The bipartisan committee unanimously adopted the findings and conclusions of the special investigator, Hogan Lovells, LLP. Those conclusions were, one, that the firewall Senator Rosenberg had promised his colleagues between his private life and his husband, Brian Hefner, and the business of the Senate was ineffective in restricting his husband's access to information from Senator Rosenberg's office. Two, Senator Rosenberg violated the Senate's IT policy by sharing his confidential computer password with Hefner, giving Hefner unfettered access to Senator Rosenberg's Senate email account. Three, Senator Rosenberg undermined the goal of the Senate's anti-harassment policy to promote a workplace free from sexual and other forms of discriminatory harassment because he knew or should have known that Hefner had racially and sexually harassed Senate employees and failed to address the issue adequately. Four, Senator Rosenberg acted unreasonably in allowing Hefner largely unfettered access to Senate information, both through direct access to his email account and through their personal communications about Senate business. And five, Senate, Senator Rosenberg's conduct did not violate any specific Senate rules, including Senate Rule 10, which prohibits senators from using their positions for personal gain. The special investigator's conclusions, which do not establish, establish a violation of any formal Senate rules, nonetheless demonstrate a significant failure of judgment and leadership by Senator Rosenberg in his role as Senate President. That failure undermined the integrity of the Senate and had destructive consequences for the Senate and the people with business before it. Essentially, Senator Rosenberg failed to protect the Senate from his husband, whom he knew was disruptive, volatile, and abusive. Therefore, we, the Senate Committee on Ethics, unanimously recommend that Senator Rosenberg not serve as Senate President, as a member of Senate leadership, or as a chair of any committee for the remainder of the 2017-2018 legislative session and for the entire 2019-2020 legislative session. We wish to thank the special investigative team from Hogan Lovells for their thorough, balanced, and professional work. The resulting report, which we are releasing in its entirety, is about 80 pages long. The investigation included 45 witness interviews of Senate personnel and others with business before the Senate, and a review of tens of thousands of pages of emails, texts, and other material. The interview included an 11-hour interview with Senator Rosenberg and his counsel, who were entirely cooperative throughout the process. The team included in, in the report only those facts that could be corroborated or, the, or were otherwise found credible. The team kept its focus on questions referred by the Senate, which concerned the conduct and actions of Senator Rosenberg. We are grateful to all of those who provided information and shared their experiences with the special investigator. We would like to ensure those indiv individuals that we took steps to protect their identities and will continue to do so going forward. The investigation was structured in a way that we never needed to know the identities of witnesses and the special investigator never shared them with us. 
The special investigator drafted the report without using witness names and kept possible identifying information to a minimum. The entire Senate as a body will now consider our report and our recommendations. And before I open the floor up for questions, I'll ask uh, Anthony Fuller, the lead investigator, if you'd like to make a, a statement. I, I, yes. So my name is Tony Fuller. I'm a partner at the Boston office of the law firm uh, known as Hogan Lovells. With me today are my colleagues Jody Newman and Natasha Tidwell. And so we led the team uh, for Hogan Lovells that conducted the investigation into the conduct of Senator Rosenberg as Senator Rodericks just described. Um, our team also included other Hogan Lovells attorneys. Uh, to elaborate a little bit on what was just said, we searched over 250,000 emails, reviewed tens of thousands of text messages and other documents, conducted 45 witness interviews um, of Senate personnel and others who had business before the Senate. Our team of attorneys spent more than uh, 1,200 hours working on the investigation and the resulting report, which you now have and I'm sure you've read by now uh, in the brief time you've had it. Um, and as mandated by the Senate order, we were uh, required to maintain the confidentiality of any witnesses who sought it. We did that to great lengths. You'll see in the report the information is de-identified. I want to reiterate that the Ethics Committee had no influence whatsoever in our work, our report, or our conclusions. Senator Rosenberg cooperated fully, as, as was just stated. He was interviewed for approximately 11, 11 hours over two days. Um, so let me briefly talk about our conclusions, which Senator Rogers just alluded to. As we began the investigation, four distinct topics came to focus, and our comprehensive report draws conclusions about each of those four, which I'll summarize. First was the firewall that was alluded to. It's not a rule of the Senate, but it was a standard that Senator Rosenberg announced on December 3rd, uh, 2014. We found that the firewall was non-existent to the extent that it was intended and understood to limit access of information between Senator Rosenberg's office and Brian Hefner. We found that Hefner had unfettered access both before and after the firewall was announced and after Senator Rosenberg was named Senate President. Second, the IT policy, we found Senator Rosenberg violated that policy continually by sharing his confidential LIS network password with Brian Hefner from 2009 through February of 2017. By doing that, he allowed Brian Hefner access to confidential Senate information. While his stated reason for doing that was to allow Hefner access to his daily schedule and to understand what he was doing on a day-to-day -day basis, that obviously could have been done in many other ways, which would not have entailed giving Hefner access to the confidential Senate information. This password access was only terminated in March of 2017 when Senator Rosenberg's staff members detected two instances of an email where uh, Brian Hefner surreptitiously emailed two other public officials as if he were Senator Rosenberg. Third, we found no evidence that Senator Rosenberg was aware that Brian Hefner had sexually assaulted Senate staff or others having business before the Senate. Nevertheless, we conclude that Senator Rosenberg severely undermined the stated goal of the Senate anti-harassment policy, which is to promote a workplace free from any kind of uh, form of harassment. We found that because we found Senator Rosenberg should have known that Brian Hefner was likely to engage in sexual and racially harassing conduct towards Senate personnel, as detailed in our report. And he did not adequately address Brian Hefner's propensity to engage in such conduct. The Senate order also asked us to look at generally at Senator Rosenberg's conduct, and we found that in light of all the things that Senator Rosenberg knew about Brian Hefner, he acted unreasonably, both in giving Brian Hefner access to his confidential password, but also in sharing day-to-day -day information about the goings-on in the Senate with him. We found that he acted unreasonably because he certainly knew that Brian Hefner was likely to misuse that information which he did, as detailed in the report. We also looked at Senate Rule 10, which was, frankly, the only rule in the Senate rules that might be applicable to this. 
factual scenario, we found, and that rule generally prohibits senators having undue influence or other Senate personnel, not just senators, having undue influence on any entity, including governmental entities, or using their office for private gain. Notably, the rule doesn't cover spouses of senators, and we found that the rule, excuse me, that Senator Rosenberg did not violate Senate Rule 10. As I stated at the outset um, of the investigation, our highest priority and guiding principle in our investigation was getting to the truth. The report does not refer to rumors or innuendo. It contains only those facts that we found um, were able to corroborate or otherwise found credible. We remain true to our commitment to conduct a full, fair, and an independent investigation. And lastly, I would like to thank uh, the victims that we spoke to and all the witnesses who, who agreed to speak with us uh, on a confidential basis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So now we can take questions. Can Please. Why you're not recommending Senator Rosenberg resign? Right here in the report, it says he knew from text messages that Hefner routinely sexualized Senate staff and other senators. Why, why hold the line at the leadership positions versus asking him to resign? I think that uh, we think that uh, whether or not Senator Rosenberg serves as a senator for his district should be up to the voters of his district to decide. Um, there is an option, as you know, uh, for expulsion. Those options is reserved for uh, members that have been convicted of criminal activities. So the sanctions that we recommend are extremely se severe uh, and have not just consequences the remaining of this legislative session, but also next legislative session. So you run for re-election? He says he's going to. That's up to him. That's up to him. Yes. We, don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. Yes. Having read the report, are you disappointed in Senator Rosenberg? Um, I I'd like to talk about the report, and not going to talk about my feelings, uh, my personal feelings, and, and hope that we can talk about the report. Did all yeah. four of the alleged victims? Yep. Did all four of these alleged victims come forward and speak with you? Some come forward and speak with you, even though you were keeping them. We don't know. We 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 don't know. We don't know what victim. We we members of the ethics committee have no idea of the identities of any victims or. Um, or witnesses. Do you want to speak to that? No, I, I think one of the things that was absolutely essential about the way this process proceeded was that we were not specifically aware of anyone who spoke to the investigator who requested anonymity or confidentiality. That was a commitment we made the day we adopted the orders that authorized this investigation, and that is something that our investigative team was completely faithful to. I will suggest to you, and I would defer to our investigators, but, but I would suggest that uh, this report is exhaustive and did not want for information. And I would defer to So you can't say you specifically talked to these men, their identities, everybody's identities remain confidential. You didn't, you we we set up, let me, let me say, um, first of all, we established a hotline at the outset of the investigation that no one availed themselves of. We didn't get any uh, tips from the hotline. So... If people didn't come to us, then we obviously did not speak to them. However, if you'll, you'll note in the report, we did speak to five people who um, experienced what I would refer to unwanted touching in the, in the form of um, various things that outlined in the report, forcible kissing, touching on the leg, grabbing of the genitals. We spoke to five people. Whether or not they're the victims you have in mind, we don't know, and we're not going to identify them. To members of the Senate, so, how is this able to happen with something so blatant as is described in here and so many people aware of this kind of behavior? How is this able to go on? Who is aware? You were aware? No, the, the Senator Rosenberg being aware, it says in here, of the disruptive behavior of other staff members expressing their concerns. And that's why we issued the sanctions, because that can not go on. We have a responsibility that if we know of any sort of sexual or racial harassment, that is our responsibility um, to report that. And we have a, uh, an order in which, in how to report that, and Senator Rosenberg did not, and that's why we're gonna take, we're taking the sanctions. I know this young lady has been patiently raising her hand politely, 
Yes. So I guess to be clear, only two of the five people that we spoke to who experienced what I just described made any kind of report. Neither of those people were Senate employees at the time. The, re the level of reporting went to one level for various reasons. It did not go above that. So Senator Rosenberg did not receive those reports. So I want to clarify that. Um, there were no, so whether or not the names were referred to the uh, law enforcement, I would decline to answer that out of, out of deference to uh, and respect for, the, for any investigations and, and certainly a pending indictment against Mr. Hefner. Attorney Fuller, if you could just speak to the fact that no tips were received on this hotline, what does that say to you? I mean, that nobody wants to come forward. That's what it said. Chairman Rogers, is there still an open question about whether or not the full Senate is going to accept this report? Or what is the caucus currently trying to decide the decision the well, the full Senate received the copy of the report just a few hours ago. As you see, it's 80 pages, it's voluminous, it contains a lot of detail, and we do what we do well and deliberate. And we're deliberating, um, having conversations, trying to get, try to understand what the report says. And we will reconvene tomorrow to do so. Are there additional sanctions still on the table that senators are discussing in caucus? We're not going to talk about what we discuss in caucus. Senator Chairman, what to say about how the Senate police itself, if there's so much troubling evidence that that's found here, there's technically no rules are broken. What does that say about how the Senate police itself? There's rules, and in the, if you read Senate Rule 12A, it's not only, doesn't only refer to Senate Rule 10, which the attorney talked about, it also talks about all misconduct. And I think the Senate did an incredible job in policing itself, in taking the report the, the order seriously of engaging a first-rate, thorough investigator of conducting that investigation and issuing uh, very serious sanctions. So based on all that we've learned in the report. I can, you know how I'll have to yell in. I'll politely take you in order. Okay, yeah, okay. We stated very clearly in our findings that um, Senator Rosenberg, ha Rosenberg had a significant failure in judgment, um, and that's why we are recommending, um, he's already stepped down the Senate President, but we recommend he cannot be considered uh, for Senate President. And not only that, we go beyond that, of any leadership position or any, any um, chair, the chair of any committee. And think about that. Though many of you know that every Democratic senator in the Senate is a chair of a committee. But to still be part of the lawmaking process? That would be up to his constituents. That would be up to his constituents. We're not going to judge. Go ahead. Senator Todd? I'm sorry. Why is this the right kind of punishment? I'd like to hear from the minority leader. Why this lack of leadership, lack of leadership position is the right time for this crime? So let me make two points. One. The Constitution gives us the inherent power to protect the Senate from harm. And we're exercising that power because harm was done to the Senate by the actions that have occurred here. And we need to be very serious about how we continue to protect the Senate in the future. What the recommendations of this committee are, are that the Senate, uh, that Senator Rosenberg will not serve in any leadership position. He will not chair a committee. He will not have any stature other than a senator. That stature is conveyed by someone's constituents at the ballot box. I think this is very, very serious. The question was asked about judgment. There was clearly a failure of judgment here, and there was clearly a failure of leadership. And those failures had consequence that harmed the Senate. And that's why we need to stand up and say that Senator Rosenberg will not be in a position to do that again for the period that's envisioned by the recommendations of this report because those failures had consequences. The question was asked about how these things happen. They happened because the atmosphere and the climate that we want to have in the Senate of respect for everyone, that atmosphere 
was breached. And we don't want to empower this individual to breach it again by having a position of leadership. Do you think the work of the Senate over the course of his presidency was compromised in any way because of his actions, his negligence? I will say that we met a while ago in this room and we structured a process and we adopted an order to compartmentalize this situation, to deal with it efficiently under the rules and effectively. And we have been doing that as a committee such that the Senate can proceed with its work in every other area. And we've done that with the effective assistance of counsel, both the counsel who stands in the corner and the law firm that did the investigation. That structure, importantly, included an ironclad commitment that we made to all of you that we would tell you everything that is in our report. We are following through on that commitment today, giving you everything that our investigators told us, and there are parts of that process that remain to be done. Under the rules, what we make is a recommendation. It is not the end of the conversation. It will be debated and it will be fully considered. Should those Senator, rules, harm could you, you tell us whether or not those rules ought to be updated? Let me suggest that at the beginning of every legislative session, we consider our rules and we adopt a set of rules. And I think they, not only should we look at what has happened here, we will. And I think all of us are deeply, deeply concerned with what's happened here. Today, we discuss what the appropriate measures should be to deal with this situation. Tomorrow, we will likely discuss preventative measures, but it is not for today's discussion. What harm Chairman, do you Chairman, think has been done to the Senate? I'm sorry, Beth, go ahead. What harm do you think has been done to the Senate? There was an atmosphere that is intolerable in the Senate that folks felt threatened by the Senate President's husband. They felt concerned about their ability to effectively function in this building. And you've heard attestations in our report of the Senate President's husband in electronic communication representing himself as the Senate President. The Senate President holds a sacred trust for the members of this body and for the citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Those representations that were made that someone was the Senate president that was not broke that trust. Can I ask both you Good and care. the chairman to respond to this, knowing that this was so blatant, knowing that so many people were aware of this, what does it say to you about the Senate culture that people were afraid to come forward? It's sad. It's sad, it's disappointing, and it's something that we should do everything within our power to change, and hopefully that change starts now. We've adopted very strict, stricter than norm anti-harassment laws, but those are just words. If they're not uh, believed, if they're not followed through on, um, then once again, then they're nothing but words on paper. But why do you think that happened? What? It's, you know, it takes a long time to change your culture sometimes, and we see it throughout our society that cultures of the culture of harassment is beginning to change. And we need to do everything in our power to ensure in this body, in this Senate, um, we take all the actions necessary to be at the forefront of that change. We, we think, and the report concludes, based on conduct that's detailed. Excuse me, did I misstate something? No, no, no. <laughs> um, we conclude that he should have known that Brian Hefner was likely to engage in sexually harassing conduct towards Senate personnel based on the wealth of information and knowledge he had about Mr. Hefner. And there's details about that. If I could just make a statement also, I did uh, express my appreciation for Hogan Lovells and their team, but let me also just publicly express my appreciation to our counsel, Jennifer Miller, 
who was uh, with us for all those painstakingly hours that we as a committee met, had conference calls on, and, and all the members of the committee. Uh, every single decision, every single vote, every single motion we voted on, every single decision that we made as a committee over the last, since December 4th, uh, was bipartisan and unanimous. Um, I think that's very, very significant thing uh, to note uh, because uh, we are a very diverse group standing in front of you, as uh, all duly elected by our constituents um, as senators um, in the legislature. Um, but we, we bring different ideas and different perspectives, but we were unanimous throughout this whole uh, process. Yes? Okay. So ladies first. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just have something. So the Senate investigates actions of its own members. Brian Hefner is not a member. He's a spouse of a member. Uh, so what we've done in our investigation, in our order, is investigate, investigate the actions and conduct of our member, Stanley Rosenberg. If, a, if the conduct of a senator is influenced, then there was, then the senator's conduct has been, is under question and violates the rules. This file the no, it did not. We, we, we cite that specifically in our press statement that that firewall failed. It was not a true firewall. But I think so in 2014, we hope that it was, was the, the Senate president, the then Senate president, represented that that's what he was going to do, and that's what failed. We relied Sen on that. Senator Cream, wish to say I, something? I think you, you actually took it up, but in question to the rules, um, we have to differentiate between the actions of Mr. Hefner and the actions of Senator Rosenberg. And some, and we read the report, it's very egregious, but mostly you're reading the actions of Brian Hefner. Uh, the question was, the information, was it available or it should have been known by Senator Rosenberg? But those thing, rules, et cetera, were mostly done by uh, not a member of the Senate. Did Rosenberg lie to his members by insisting the firewall was working? If you read the you report, that you felt that way. Uh, in the report, I think you need to read the, in the report, uh, I think that he states that he had a different idea of what the firewall meant. Uh, we all uh, had a similar idea, but unfortunately, it appears that it was different than the idea that Senator Rosenberg had. Take one last question. Have, uh, Senator Rosenberg's lower staff members face discipline, because according to the report, they directly received these reports of sexual misconduct. So are they either still in the Senate, and does anyone else face discipline or investigation? Uh, we don't know the identities of those lower staff. We don't know. We've, they were witnesses, so they where their identities were protected also. So we don't know if they're still currently employees or because we are protecting the identities of all Now that you witnesses. know this, though, do you think this is something that should be looked into if people knew this information and failed to protect others? We will have a thorough review, as we do every legislative session, of all of our rules. Can you yep. address the question about racial harassment? Because that sort of seems to be a new element that we haven't heard about before the summary. <laughs> The committee released said that Senator Rosenberg knew or should have known that yep. Sefter had racially and sexually harassed some employees and Don't failed to address it adequately. Racial. But the, the summary racial here harassment. indicates one incident where this happened, and then it concludes saying the staff member believed Senator Rosenberg sufficiently addressed the issue with Hefner because the member received no further phone calls. Can I can I address one thing before that? The question about whether uh, the junior staff member should face discipline. Um, I want to be, and it's very clear in the report that the victim um, did not report all of the details of what was reported to us, and that the person who received the report didn't understand that 
the person was receiving some kind of official complaint that, w that was of the nature that should be brought up the chain of command. So that's clear in the report. I don't want to have a misconception based on anything that was said here today. And I apologize, sir, about I don't I didn't catch your entire question because I was. Well, it's just this, the, the issue of, of racially harassing uh, people that had not really been part of what we understood the case was about until now. And the summary says that that's one of the things that it says Senator Rosenberg knew or should have known. He was aware of, a, of, of an incident of. Uh, and failed to address it adequately. But the, the report itself seems to suggest at least the insinuation is that it was addressed because the one he, person he, reporting it said it didn't recur after it, it was raised to Senator Rosenberg. So the report, if you keep reading, there's another instance after that that occurred via a text message that was a similarly racially offensive remark that Senator Rosenberg was aware of. So it wasn't adequately addressed, and that's what that was. That's what we found. Thank you, Thank you all Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.